I returned earlier this week from our congregational trip to Israel and the United Arab Emirates, where I saw the remarkable progress made by the two countries in such a short period of time. Both countries are new. Israel just celebrated its 74th year of independence, and the UAE was established as a country in 1971. Yet both have ancient ties, roots, and history in the land. Both have sprung up out of desert sands with magnificent skyscrapers surging towards the heavens and thriving economies. Although one of them had the good fortune of having just a little bit of black gold in the sand beneath its surface, which helped a lot. Well, next week I'll report on my thoughts and observations about the UAE, and you're invited to come back then. But this week, I want to report to you about Israel, where we witnessed the always moving Yom Hazikaron, Israel's Memorial Day, and joined in the festive Yom Ha'atzma'ut celebrations. We were priv privileged to hear from several brilliant and courageous Israeli spokesmen and statesmen, Ron Dermer, Israel's former ambassador to the United States, and Natan Sharansky, both of whom share their insights and perspectives on current developments. But I want to focus just on one visit, because I think it captures and conveys a great deal about the essence of what Israel is and what it's all about. And in some way, it relates a little bit to our tour portion, which talked about, in which Jake and explained to us, it talks about what to do with the land and agriculture. All of us by now are familiar with the notion that Israel has made the desert bloom, which is especially important since more than 60% of the land of Israel is covered by desert. At the amazing Paris Center for Peace and Innovation, we invited Daniel Abraham of the Valkani Institute for Agricultural Research to take us beyond that almost trite phrase and explain to us the cutting edge work that Israel is doing to solve the world's food problems. Established before the founding of the State of Israel in 1921, the Valkani Center is Israel's national agricultural research and development center and has been the driving force behind its agricultural expertise and innovations. Their work is predicated upon the notion that it is the job of scientists to partner with farmers and to find solutions for the problems that they encounter and then to apply that knowledge. A few interesting facts that you may or may not be aware of, but which are a source of great pride for Israel. Did you know that cherry tomatoes come from Israel? Did you know drip irrigation was also invented in Israel? Okay, but what you might not know is that whereas most cows produce about 6,000 liters of milk a year, Israeli cows produce more than twice that amount, 13,000 on average. How is that possible? Are Israeli cows smarter than others? No. Scientists at the Volcani Institute have invented something that resembles and can best be described as kind of like a Fitbit for cows that then relays important information about each cow, which then is able to be used by the farmers to determine and monitor their diet. Danielle attributed how such a small country is a global leader and making such an impact in the field of agricultural innovation to three primary factors. For one, it has the courage to pursue an ideology, and that ideology is Zionism. When Jews started coming to Israel in large numbers from Europe in the late 1800s and early 1900s, most of those who came from Europe came from urban population centers. If they were inspired by the Zionist ideology and the pioneering spirit to come and to build the land, the guiding principle of the young pioneers, what I remember learning to sing when I was a youngster in Hebrew school was, Anu banu artsa, livnot ulihibanot. We have come to the land to build and to be built by it. The second motivating factor behind Israel's remarkable success is that Israelis have the courage to create and then to seek to realize a vision. It was Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, who f articulated the dream of making the desert bloom. He said, either we will conquer the desert, the Negev, or it will conquer us. We have no choice. 
Shortly after Israel became a country, Ben-Gurion convened a team of engineers and told them how important it was to get water to the Negev, to the desert in the south. He asked them to build a pipeline to bring water 250 kilometers from the Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, to the Negev. And when he was told that they couldn't do it, Ben-Gurion bluntly said, then bring me the engineers who can. And guess what? They did. The third principle guiding the work, not just of the Volcani Institute, but of Israel, is the courage to think outside of the box. Not to be afraid to take risks or to have a fear of failure. Indeed, on more than one occasion, I've heard Israeli entrepreneurs not despair when something did not go right, when something went wrong, but say only that failure meant they were one step closer to success. With the disruptions to the global markets and supply chain caused by COVID-19, along with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, one major problem confronting the world right now is that about 20% of the grain, which is stored in large storage silos, evaporates. This problem is even greater in especially hot climates, where it could be as high as 40% of the grain that is lost to evaporation. But Israel, through the Volcani Institute, has figured out a way to reduce the loss of grain stored in silos, not to 20%, not to 40%, but to less than 0.5%. Think of that and the impact that will have. Especially now, at a time when Ukraine, the breadbasket of the world, is under attack, this is a significant contribution that will help the world. For Israel seeks to help to eliminate global hunger and food insecurity, not just in Israel, but around the world, as it willingly shares its knowledge, its expertise, and its innovation with agronomists and farmers and agriculturalists who come from all around the world in order to learn. Indeed, representatives from the United Arab Emirates started coming to study at the Volcani Center years before the Abraham Accords were ever signed because they realized they could benefit and help their people by doing so. Since COVID has limited actual visits, the center offered to share its work via Zoom. And for one course, they offered Caribbean farmers who have been told by the United States, don't worry about food, just build your tourism industry. And now they found that they need to worry about food. And so they expected a few dozen participants to participate in this four-part Zoom course, but over 2,000 signed up for the four-part session. Indeed, you're not only fulfilling the vision of Theodor Herzl and of Zionism, but rather also the prophetic vision that the Jewish people shall be an or la goyim, a light unto the nations. And yes, in case you were wondering, much of the knowledge is shared with those who are proclaimed enemies of Israel. So the next time you read in the paper or you hear a rabbi give a sermon bemoaning the uprooting of Palestinian olive trees, tell them, to also speak not just about Hamas sending incendiary kites to burn Israeli crops and trees, but tell them to also speak about what Israel does to help Palestinian farmers and how it helps them learn how to grow their olive trees to be better, stronger, and to produce more fruit. Now, what I've just shared with you, probably you don't know all of this is happening on a daily basis unless you actually go to Israel. And I would add, you only get this on a trip with us, the next one of which will be this winter break, Bezrat Hashem. And instead of hearing about these positive developments, what you hear about pertaining to Israel probably in the last couple of weeks is most likely about the journalist for Al Jazeera, who was killed in crossfire while covering a shootout between IDF soldiers and Palestinian gunmen who were shooting randomly. What does the fact that there are those who, without the benefit of an objective investigation, have already concluded that Israel is responsible for her death, tell us. But even more telling, I want to ask this question, and why is it that in the last 30 years, some 1,500 journalists have been killed covering active combat situations, yet the world seems to only be aware of one incident? 
Did the same media also inform you and express similar outrage that on Israel's Independence Day, three Israelis were brutally murdered by axe-wielding Palestinian terrorists as part of a wave of attacks over the last several weeks in which 19 innocent Israelis have been killed? To put things in perspective, Ambassador Dermer reminded us that in the 74 years of Israel's existence, sadly, 24,000 soldiers have died. And there have been some 3,000 victims of Arab terror. But as he said, they died defending the Jewish homeland. In a forest in Ukraine, Babi Yar, some 80 years ago, 33,000 Jews were murdered in two days. In 1948, there were 800,000 people living in the state of Israel. Today, it is home to more than 9 million. In 1960, Israel's gross domestic product per capita was $1,229. By 2010, it was 21,000, and today, it is over 44,000. So how do you explain this? How do you explain this miracle that you have to see for yourself to believe it? What's the manifestation of how ideology and attitude can influence a country? Something I'll talk about next week in connection with the amazing accomplishments of the UAE. But this manifestation and bringing together of ideology and attitude can be best summed up by what Ben-Gurion famously said, and that was, in Israel, to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. And so we pray, may the miracle of modern day Israel continue to flourish, and may we partake, celebrate, and be a part of that miracle. And let us say, Amen.